One of the most exciting aspects of the grimoire renaissance that we have found ourselves in in the last decade or so is this amazing and beautiful constant updating, refining, and dialing in of magical procedures, techniques, and processes. And it reminds me of this great quote from the poet Walt Whitman, one of my favorites, who says, quote, all goes onward and outward nothing collapses. And that uncollapsible ishness factor includes so many things in the grimoire tradition, including updated pronunciation and spelling of commonly recited divine names that are used in spirit evocatory or invocatory procedures, including four updated names, which we are going to discuss in this video today. Hello, this is Alexander F., and I am the host of the Esoteric Glitch Bottle podcast and channel, and today we're looking at these four common pronounced or mispronounced names and some updates in recent years and corrections due to awesome scholarship in the last few years. And so I'm sharing this post first with my awesome, ineffable, amazing patrons over at patreon.com slash glitch bottle. So if you'd like to support the channel with exclusive perks, please consider heading over there and I look forward to chatting with you. Now, before we get into these four updated common pronunciations or mispronunciations regarding these grimoire nomina magica, you might ask, why does this even matter? That's a very good question, actually, because in Western ceremonial magic or Solomonic grimoiric spirit evocation, the correct pronunciation of nomina magica or magical divine names is vital to a successful conjuring of spirits. These names are names that you may hear in the Bible, for example. And they would include things like Adonai, Shaddai, Tzabeoth, El, Agios, Tetragrammaton, Otheos, Iskeros, Sathanatos, Parakletos, and so many others. And they're usually, when you see these names in the grimoires, they're usually some derivation of Hebrew, Greek, Arabic, or Latin names of God. Or, though commonly, these names, these nomina magica, are also known as verba ignota, or unknown words. And these are found in many different grimoires, but I'm thinking of the Ars Notoria Angel Grimoire, for example, with words that don't seem to have any derivation at all. These could be words like Suaf nezenon, inhankon, manenas, gereuran, and so many, so many other names, hundreds and hundreds of names. And these names are spoken, they're chanted, or they're sung aloud or vibrated, if you prefer, as part of the spirit evocation process in order to do a few things, to show the operator's authority. So this is to show your authority as an operator, as a magician, and your effectively ambassadorial connection to the divine. So the magician is, by reciting these names, you are impressing upon the spirit or spirits who you are invoking or evoking that they, meaning the magician, is someone who's authorized to wield and speak the names of God because they have divine authority in order to facilitate the successful conjuring, manifesting, and binding of a spirit. So, this name and knowing about what is this name? How does this fit into the larger grimoire tradition? What is the meaning of this name? What's the history behind it? All of this does this other really important thing called building subjective synthesis. This is a concept that was developed by Dr. Joseph Lisuski, or at least it was broadly mentioned by Dr. Joseph Lisuski. I think he helped popularize it in his book, Ceremonial Magic and the Power of Evocation. And so basically, Lisuski says that the more that you know about and explore a ritual, its history, its meaning, and its kinetics, the more that you integrate and develop a connection to the names the ritual, and the process of an evocation. So, effectively, the more that you know about the meaning of a name or the history of a spirit, effectively, the more esoteric gravity you have. This is kind of one of the ways I conceptualize of it. And the more gravity you have, just like a star, you standing in the middle of the circle, you're better able to pull in the spirits into the orbit of your ritual, if you will. 
And so in this video, we have four, yes, four updated names that are found in popular grimoires that I'd like to draw our attention to. And it's not just me, thank goodness. Um, I have invited some excellent guests and previous Glitch Bottle podcast guests uh, who are experts in Hebrew and in Greek pronunciation to help out with these names. So without further ado, let's get started. And the first word that we are going to talk about that is commonly pronounced or actually mispronounced is the word amioram, which is seen in many well-known grimoires like the Heptameron or the Lamegatins of Goetia. This name, however, is very likely a corruption of the actual Hebrew word ha nora or ha nora, meaning the terrible or the awesome. And the more correct version of the name in the grimoires is rendered a nora, which is much more accurate to ha nora. So let's get into some of these details. So in this word, amioram, or sometimes spelled amiorem with an R-E-M, it's found in grimoires like the Lamegatins Goetia, the Heptameron, and others. And in the Goetia, amioram is used in at least three separate conjurations. So the Lamegatins Goetia has several conjurations, all designed to generate magical tension. And this word, amioram or amiorem, is found in the first conjuration. It's found in the constraint conjuration. And it's also found in the general curse called the spirit's chain against all spirits that rebel, a very powerful and focused uh, part of the ritual if needed. And each of these curses or conjurations is designed to build up more magical tension for you, the operator, while you're in the ritual. And in the Heptameron grimoire, the same name, Amioram, is used during the part of the ritual known as the exorcism of the spirits of the air. This is the powerful conjuration, also known as the Vinculum Salomonis, or the bond or chain of Solomon during what's arguably the most intense recitation aspect of the ritual. And this is where the operator declares, quote, Therefore, come ye by these names, Adonai Tzabeoth, Adonai Amioram, come ye, come ye, Adonai commandeth you, Shaddai, the most mighty and dreadful king of kings, whose power no creature is able to resist, be unto you most dreadful, unless ye obey, and forthwith affably appear before this circle, let miserable ruin and fire unquenchable remain with you. Therefore, come ye, in the name of Adonai Tzabeoth, Adonai Amioram, come, come, why stay you? Hasten, Adonai Shaddai, the king of kings, commands you. Now again, in a ritual, this powerful aspect of the ritual, this vinculum, this technique, the names, at least for me, would be vibrated. Things would be slowed down a lot, but I'm just reading it to give you a feel for what's going on in the text of the ritual itself. And for me, when it comes to this word, amioram, the great grimoire translator, scholar, and proprietor of esotericarchives.com, Joseph H. Peterson, was the first person to point out to me that amioram isn't all it's conjured up to be because it actually points to a Hebrew etymology saying on page 240 of his book, The Elucidation of Necromancy, Joseph H. Peterson says that, quote, Amioram seems to be a shared error for Anora in Lucidarium and Heptameron. Anora is found in the Raziel manuscripts and other magical texts rendering the Hebrew Hanora, the terrible. He also says to see Bohak 2003, page 76 as a reference. Joe says, quote, it is also found on the Semaphorus table and VSG, which is another Luchidarium manuscript, reads Amora. So a quick note to listeners as well. If you have not already, I cannot stress this enough, please get your own copy of Joseph H. Peterson's Elucidation of Necromancy. It is a beautiful scholarly translation and contextualization of no less than three versions of the original Heptameron. 
the Lucidarium Necromanciae, or the Lucidarium Necromanciae, and it includes a freshly translated original Heptameron. So this is just such a wonderful book, so please make sure to check that out in the links below. Also, in addition, I just think that we all owe Joseph H. Peterson a debt of gratitude for esotericarchives.com. This is an incredible website with a wealth of free information, grimoire translations and notes, many of which are being cited in this video. And so make sure to also support Joe by checking out his other books and writings with the links in the video description. Joe is truly a gem of a person and a scholar. Okay, so back to this name, this first name we're addressing, Amioram, which we now know is likely Anora or Hanora in Hebrew, the terrible or the awesome. This word is actually found in the Bible in Deuteronomy 10, 17, which says, quote, for the Lord, your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes, unquote. I also thought when it comes to this word, Nora or ha Nora. Uh, that there was additional modern context that was interesting from HebrewPod101.com, which says that, quote, in modern day Hebrew, the meaning of the word nora has lost its positive aspects and it became more about the fear-inducing aspects, becoming an adjective meaning terrible or awful, like in these examples. If you are, say, speaking to someone today and you're speaking Hebrew and you want to say ha-seret haya nora, you're saying the movie was awful. The movie was nora, it was terrible. So that was just an interesting uh, context about how the word has changed over time. But okay, so now that we know that amioram is very likely ha nora or an nora in the corrected grimoire conjurations, that's great. However, please, please do not take my word for it. Thankfully, I have asked, and I'm so glad that he agreed, uh, for an expert in Hebrew and Jewish esotericism, Rabbi Yosef Cohen, to share a little more esoteric and historic context around this word, nora. So, Rabbi Cohen, please take it away. Hello, this is Rabbi Yosef Cohen discussing the word nora. Nora is a biblical Hebrew word, which means awesome in the literal sense of being fearsome or, or terrible. It's found throughout the Bible as well as in the Shemona Esrei prayer, or otherwise known as the Amidah, which is a traditional prayer, the main uh, Jewish prayer that is recited three times a day. It's in the beginning of the blessing, of the first of the 18 blessings, which God is described as HaGadol HaGibor Vanora El Elyon, which means the great, mighty, and awesome God, the Supreme God. Here it is referred to as Hanura with the letter He as a prefix, which means the. So Hanura means the awesome. On a more mystical sense, it's also discussed in the Sefer Merkava Shlima, a collection of Merkava texts that was first published in 1921 in Jerusalem from the manuscript collection of Rabbi Shlomo Musayef. Rabbi Shlomo Musayef was a Bukharian rabbi that immigrated to Israel, and he had a tremendous collection of, of Hebrew manuscripts, many of them discussing many magical and mystical works. A short collection of the manuscripts discussing their Merkaba tr traditions is Merkaba Shlema. On page six of this book, there is a short prayer called Tefilat Keter Nora, which means the prayer of the awesome crown. Now, the word Keter, meaning crown, is found in the ten Sfirot as the highest emanation Sphira. However, regarding this prayer, Keter Nora, it is not related to that. It just literally means crown here. So Tefilat Keter Nora is the prayer of the awesome or fearsome crown. And it's a short prayer which discusses uh, using some magical names, mystical names of God to prayer for success in one's learning and retention of one's uh, learning of Torah and law and, and so forth. 
So Rabbi Cohen will return also to tell us about another corrected grimoire, Nomina Magica update, in a little bit as well. But also, please make sure to check out the video description below to check out Rabbi Cohen's awesome book, Magnus Liber Sigillorum, which is an abridged English translation of the Hebrew original containing many magical alphabets and recipes called from ancient and medieval Jewish manuscripts of magic and also practical Kabbalah. So definitely check out that and also his appearance on the Glitch Bottle podcast as well. So Rabbi Cohen is absolutely fantastic. And this leads us to word number two two that we are going to talk about being a corrected or updated grimoire nomina magica and that word is anekphoniton is the correct word and you may have seen this word in the grimoires and it may be expressed in different ways like anaphexaton or anaphenaton or other misspelled variations but the correct is very likely anekphoniton now this name has Greek origins, and it's seen in grimoires from the 1300s, like the Sworn Book of Honorius and other manuscripts. And this name, it's so fascinating because the name spoken as one of the many nomina magica or divine names of power in a verbal conjuration of spirits. For example, in the Lamegatons Goetia, this name, which is actually misspelled as anaphexaton, is part of a long list of divine names used to congregate spirits. Quote, and by the name Anaphexaton, which Aaron heard and spake and became wise, unquote. So Anaphexaton, with the correct spelling being Anaphonaton, is also, in addition to being spoken, it's physically written on magical implements or materia magica used in magical rituals. Two examples of this are from the Lamegatons Goetia, the Ring of Solomon that's worn by the practitioner, and also the floor triangle or the triangle of art that is drawn or inscribed on the floor in many cases, which marks the location where the spirit will manifest. And so both of the images of the ring and the triangle in this video are being taken from esoteric art archives.com. Again, check out that website. It's a great resource. So the name is misspelled in various ways, but the likely original name of this is Anekphonaton. But what does this name even mean? Well, on Esoteric Archives, the great Joseph H. Peterson adds this context on the ring of Solomon in the Lamegatons Goetia grimoire. And this ring in the image itself, seems to have an X written above the incorrect name, Anaphenaton. And so Joseph Peterson says, quote, around the ring is written the sacred name Anaphenaton, as well as Michael or Michael outside, and Tetragrammaton is engraved on the inside. Above the first N of Anaphenaton is written X, indicating the scribe was not certain if the name was spelled with an N or an X. I believe, Joseph H. Peterson says, this to be the same as the Greek anekphonaton, which means unpronounceable, sometimes used to refer to the tetragrammaton, Jehovah, yod he vav This name, unquote, this name definitely makes sense to me because as I was reading Joseph H. Peterson's quote on Esoteric Archives, the tetragrammaton name of God was historically not supposed to be pronounced at all. It was considered one of, if not the highest name of the holy God. And it was only pronounced once a year by the Jewish high priest in the temple on the day of atonement in the Holy of Holies. And I'm so honored to this very point of Anakphonaton that the wonderful Ioannis Marathakis, scholar, translator, and academic with an extensive knowledge of ceremonial magic, he's here and he's joining us to share about the pronunciation and some of the context of Anakphonaton. Hello, this is Ioannis Marathakis, and in this audio I will give the medieval pronunciation of four Greek words that may have been the original forms of certain holy names in the grimoires. And more specifically, I will give the pronunciation that was used after the 11th century 
which is actually the same with contemporary Greek. First of all, I'm 100% certain that the word uh, anaphexeton is a corrupt form of the Greek anekphoniton, which means unpronounceable. And I am that certain because this word appears together with tetragrammaton in many sources. Note that I am not equally certain about the rest of the words. Ioannis is also a previous guest on the Glitch Bottle podcast, and he was sharing about the key grimoire, the magical treatise of Solomon, the Hygromantia, which Ioannis translated from Greek into English. So make sure to check out the links below to get a copy of Ioannis's book as well. And so, so far we have Anora, and we have anekphanaton. This brings us to word number three. That is a corrected or updated grimoire nomina magica. And this one is a more complex one because it has multiple possibilities. And so in the grimoires like the Goetia and the Heptameron, you will often see this name, Eskerahie Oriston or Eskerahie Oriston. This has different pronunciations depending on how you read the word. And it's seen in grimoires like the Megatons Goetia and the Eleuchidarium or the Heptameron, again, as part of a long list of divine names or vinculum or chain of Solomon, which is really a chain of powerful words used to conjure spirits, as in this example, quote, and by the name Eskerehie Oristan, which Moses named, and all the rivers brought forth frogs, and they ascended into the houses of the Egyptians, destroying all things, unquote. So, do we have any idea on what Eskerehie Oristan means? Well, this is very interesting because after chatting with scholars and experts in this area, there are two likely possibilities and one that seems to be at least the most likely. So let's explore this right now. So possibility number one is that the two words that compose Eskerahie Oristan are both Greek in origin. This was first suggested, and the first time I saw it, in the incredible tome and a book that Solomonic magicians must have, if you can, The Goetia of Dr. Rudd by the excellent Dr. Stephen Skinner and David Rankin. And they surmise that this word, Eskerahie Oristan, as being potentially derived from two Greek words, ischuros and aristos. Ischuros meaning strong, and aristos meaning noble. And this is where we get the word aristocrat from, for example. So here again is scholar and translator Ioannis Marathakis with some additional context. The word oriston may have its source in the Greek Ariston, that means very good, very fine, or very noble. As an adjective, it can change forms depending on the gender of the noun it defines. So it would be Ariston for neutral nouns, such as name, but Aristos for male nouns, such as God. Finally, the word Eskerehie may have its source in the Greek Ischiros, that means strong. But for this last name, I personally prefer the Hebrew etymology. Okay, so that's option number one, where both words in Eskerahie Oristan are Greek in origin. But as Ioannis just touched on a second ago, that there's a second and most likely option, option number two, which is where the first word, Eskerehie, is actually Hebrew and not Greek in origin, a very famous Hebrew divine name found in the Bible. So let's dive into this, option two, for this nomina magica. So in this option, Eskerehie is actually the Hebrew name Ehye Asher Ehye, which is Hebrew for I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. This is a very famous quote. You may have heard it before from the book of Exodus in the Bible. And so here again is scholar Rabbi Yosef Cohen to share some more context about this divine name and how it's used in a conjuration of the seven jinn kings as well. 
Take it away, Rabbi Cohen. Hello, this is Rabbi Cohen explaining the source of this name. This name actually is found in the Bible, in the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And it's discussing when God first reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses asks God, uh, when I go to the uh, children of Israel, uh, what should I tell them? What, what name should I relate to them? And then in this verse, God tells Moses that he should reveal to them as, Eyeh, Asher, Eyeh, I am who I am. And you should tell that to them. The verse in Hebrew, I will read to you, says, now, this name is interpreted in terms of a midrash, meaning I am going to redeem you from your current exile, and I am who will redeem you from future exiles. In a more magical sense, this name is found often in different Jewish magical texts, the Sefer Shora Shemot, the book of the root of the names by Rabbi Moshe Zakuto, an Italian capitalist, has this name recorded several times. It is also found in Rabbi Chaim Vital's book of his, auto, his autobiographical diary of magic, now known as Sefer Hapulot. And he also quotes this name in a very interesting Adjuration of the Seven Jinn Kings is found in Helek Dawid Simon Kuf Tzaditet, which means Part 4, Section 199. And to paraphrase the Hebrew, it says that he, a person that's trying to communicate and speak to the Seven Kings, should adjure them with the following adjuration. I'll just you know, a loose free translation from the Hebrew. It says that you should call out to them that you should listen to me in the name of the great name of God and the names I will call upon thee for the sake of Eyeh Asher Eyeh, and for the sake of Shakesh Meherakesh, Aksha Aksha Matash, Pasha Pansha, Vachash Hakash Machash, Vachshad Shlush Shayush, that he should come and he should. Because of these names, listen to me, and for their sake, uh, do what I do quickly, quickly. Rabbi Vital then writes that this should be written or said on a Thursday, and it should also be uh, burnt with the following incense of mukla azgrak, which is some kind of Arabic spice, I assume. I don't know Arabic, but that's how the uh, ritual is brought down here. In addition, grimoire translator and scholar Andy Foster, who has been instrumental in recent years translating passages along with other scholars from the Summa Sacra Magice and other texts, says that, quote, the name was mentioned by ancient church fathers. It is definitely a hie, asher a hie. Despite that, Andy says... Oriston, or Oristion, or Ariston, that second word, has Greek origins, and the grimoire traditions usually mixed different names, unquote. So, Foster, in addition to this, he also suggests that the name Oriston also is similar to an ancient Greek word, meaning one who stands on a mountain. So, there you go. Likely option number two of this name is a combination of two words. The first is Hebrew, ahyeh, asher ahyeh, and the second is the Greek, aristos. And as we heard from Andy Foster, the grimoire tradition does mix names of different languages. And finally, this brings us to nomina magica number four. That is a corrected or updated grimoire word used in conjuration. And that word is... Economos. Economos is the correct way to pronounce this word, or very likely the word that it's pointing to, which you may see this in many of the grimoires incorrectly or with alternative spellings like Actinomos, Hokinomos, and many other variations. And so this name, Economos, it has Greek origins and it's seen in grimoires from the 1300s, like the Sworn Book of Honorius, and also the Heptameron, and the Lamegatons Goetia, and the Theurgia Goetia as well. And in the Sworn Book of Honorius, 
Sagittarius, for example. The operator is to present the pentacle or the sign of Solomon during a very intense moment of the ritual, and the spirits are told by the operator to obey the operator, who is called the exorcist. And at the end of this part, the operator says, quote, and by the holy seal, which commands power over you, and by the virtue of the heavenly spirits, and by the person of the exorcist who is conjuring you, hasten to come and obey your master who is called Economos. And we also have here, regarding Economos, in the Goetia and Heptameron, very similar, quote, and by the virtue of the celestial spirits, your lords, and by the person of the exorcist being conjured, make haste to come and yield obedience to your master who is called Akti Nomos. And so, where does this name Ikonomos, the actual Greek name Ikonomos, come from? And what the heck does it even mean? Well, Joseph H. Peterson mentions on esotericarchives.com that the name is, quote, from the Greek ekonomos, meaning steward or administrator. It is found in Greek and Coptic religious and magic texts going back to antiquity. Multiple distortions occur. And Joseph Peterson gives some examples. Okinomos, akimomos, aktimomos, or hokinomas. This is used, Joseph H. Peterson says, as an epithet of God, angels, as well as other beings, unquote. And so here again is Ioannis Marathakis sharing about and pronouncing this name. The word octinomos may have its source in the Greek ikonomos, that means steward or administrator. Okay, so what the heck does it even mean, though, to be an ekonomos, a steward or an administrator? An administrator of what exactly? And we know with Joseph H. Peterson that this goes back to religious and magical texts in Greek and Coptic texts going back to antiquity. So this is really cool because a 2022 article from the Journal of the General Union of Arab Archaeologists explores this very word, and I'll make sure to put a link in the video description. The article is entitled, quote, The Function and Identity of the Steward, Ikonomos, a Linguistic Analytical Study of Coptic Documents, and it contains some awesome information about this role and the word ekonomos, as it was used from the 5th century to the 11th century of our common era, saying, quote, The functions of the steward were very extensive. He had the upper hand over the monastic administration, as he was a high financial official with all financial transactions, and his authority is also asserted on the monastery treasury. In addition to his religious duties, and in several documents dated to the 7th and 9th centuries, the steward almost always appears as the legal representative of the convent and, in his name, signs contracts, accepts donations, and consecrated children to the convent, unquote. So this is really interesting about signing contracts and having jurisdiction in the convent. In addition... There are other duties that seem, at least to me, to have fingerprints of magical involvement or of that role being used as a magical name to show magical authority with the title of Economos, including things mentioned in the article such as providing the monastery's library's needs of religious books. One of the clergies responsible for baptism in the monastery was the Economos, and the Economos was most often named on the stand of water jars. This is interesting because I think in the magical tradition of setting up water jars in antiquity, imprisoning demons in water jars, asking a spirit to knock over a jar of water as a sign of its successfully leaving. So that's an interesting point. Another one in the article is, uh, the Economos was responsible for all financial transactions of the monastery or the church who hand to him over all the community work and demanding contracts with the world. So again, we get this sense of contracts and having binding authority. That's fascinating and directly related to magical involvement. Again, I'm not saying there's a direct correlation, but if the grimoires coming out of these centuries, the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 
10th, 11th centuries in, say, the Byzantine Empire, in the Islamic world, and also, of course, in the Latin-speaking parts of Europe. That's a fascinating connection. Also, and this is so fascinating to me and directly uh, connects in my mind to a phrase in the Heptameron as well about having the spirits obey their celestial angels or celestial masters. And this is in the article where the archangels Gabriel and Mikhail bear the name Ikonomos in many ancient church documents. I just find that fascinating. And so in all of this, to me, the Ikonomo seems to be someone who has specific powers over contracts, over books, organizing archives in the library, and also with connections to the angels Gabriel and Michael, which map onto the authority and that the conjurations themselves have in the grimoires. So I hope that you enjoyed this video as a quick summary and as a recap and I'll put it on the screen here, the different names that we ran through today is that the word Amioram is actually very likely Anora or Hanora, Hebrew for the terrible. Anaphexaton that you see in the grimoires is actually Anakphoneton, the Greek unpronounceable, aka the Tetragrammaton. The name that you see in grimoires like the Heptameron or the Lamegatons Goetia, Eskerehie Oristan, could be Ischuros Aristos, which is Greek strong and noble, or much more likely that first word, Eskerehie, is actually the Hebrew Ehie. Asher Ehyeh, I am who I am, with the second word remaining likely Oriston or Oristos. And finally, the word Actinomos is actually Ikonomos, which is the Greek Ikonomos, meaning steward or administrator. So there you have it, Glitch Bottle patrons and listeners. I hope you enjoyed this. I know that this was a deep dive, but it really is just a way that I wanted to share my appreciation for the amazing developments dialing in, the cross-pollination, all of this awesome scholarship and research, and also having some amazing guests and previous uh, Glitch Bottle guests on this video to help with the pronunciation and the context, and Joseph H. Peterson's amazing work and esotericarchives.com. It just shows that this grimoire renaissance is far from over to me. It is continuing to develop and evolve and just, just be that amazing growth that we're seeing both in scholarship and also in practice itself. And so I hope that as you continue to look at these names, maybe practice some of the grimoires or conduct an actual ritual, I hope that you keep in mind those beautiful words that we started the video with from the poet Walt Whitman who says that all goes onward and outward and nothing collapses. This is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light.